Welcome to the third theme, uh, Software Architecture 2DV604. Uh, this theme focuses on architecture documentation. Uh, the first lecture introduces, uh, well, the basics. Um, some of it you, you heard before, architectural views, viewpoints. Uh, in the second, we focus more on, on various types of models, models that you use to express uh, the decisions you make about the architectural significant requirements. So, so moving on, architecture documentation. Well, there is uh, not a straightforward way to, to deal with architecture documentation because there are so many aspects of, of just the well of architecture that, that can be difficult to, to, to document. Uh, however, it is important to, to uh, document some aspects of, of architecture. Uh, even if you have an agile uh, process model where you move forward and, and the product uh, is the documentation, it is important that you continue to, to document at least the most important parts of your architecture. Uh, because at some point, always happens, there is something that someone has forgotten and, and it can take time and if it can also be the uh, source of, of uh, errors being made, introducing faults uh, that can have more uh, challenging uh, if, um, effects down the road. Uh, for instance, that, that your architecture erodes and, and some of the decisions you made will, uh, you have made, uh, will not be valid for the life cycle, for the entire life cycle. Uh, and that can be uh, disastrous uh, for your systems and require a huge refactoring at some point. One example here is if, if you see open source projects, they often have problems with uh, the overall architecture. It's not too uncommon that as they develop, as they grow, at some point they take a couple of steps back and maybe not restart, but at least they make huge refactorings from time to time. Uh, it's not necessarily the an indication of a bad design initially, but it could be that, that the lack of documentation uh, has led to a situation where that, well, we have to take a couple of steps back and, and, and restart. So documenting architecture means documenting strategic decisions. And, and here is the bucket again, and here is the architect. And, and we have the concern, and we have the requirements, and we have the decisions, and we have the rationale, which is why we make the decision. If you are able to, to capture these four aspects somehow and you capture them to a degree where it's good enough well then it's good enough so it's not about how much you can document it's about what you document so don't document something that is unnecessary Focus on the parts that is important to document. And if you can keep a, the documents short, fine. If it's a drawing on the whiteboard, fine. But if you need the documentation, document it somewhere. So coming back to this slide, you've seen it a couple of times. Now we added a part of the model in the ISO 42010 standard. And, and the important part here is this little part down here where you have stakeholders and system concerns. So stakeholders and system concerns, well, that is the entry point for uh, documentation because when we develop something, when we design something, when we reason about something, we do that in order to, to meet, to answer questions from the stakeholders. And they are concerned, they have an interest in the system. And uh, 
if you look at architecture documentation, well, it is true that that uh, the architecture of the system is the system's architecture. So the uh, agile tradition or principle that the system is the best documentation, well, to some extent that is true also at the architectural level because it's the true architecture. However, one of the intentions of software architecture as, as we presented in this course is that you need a tool to specify, to, to reason about design options and make the architectural decisions way before you have a system up and running. So in that sense, you need another flavor of architecture. You need a documented architecture, which is prescriptive. That is like an instruction to designers, to developers, to do the architecture like this. In that sense, you make architecture intentional. That is that it's an intent that it should look the way it looks. So the decisions you make, that's the intent. And that's why the decisions are so important, but a decision is just one part. Sometimes the road that led up to a decision or a set of decisions is equally important or even more important. So document why you do certain things, why you decide a certain path or go for a certain option. Also uh, include the ones that you disregarded or, or you toned down the trade-offs that, well, we decided to go for this mechanism and we are aware of that we have to sacrifice this quality over here, but that's a decision we make that's intentional. So uh, remember that we have a descriptive architecture that is the true architecture, but we can also use architecture prescriptive to communicate the w how we would like the architecture because that's the way we have get an architecture that enables the qualities we want. So descriptive and prescriptive are important. And uh, it's also important to see that the system exhibits an architecture and the description expresses the architecture. So the ISO standard also uh, takes these two perspectives into account. So one of the important parts that we haven't spent too much time on is, is the viewpoint. And, and uh, the, the ISO standard focuses on stakeholders, their concerns and views that describe the decisions made with respect to this concern and the stakeholder. So some concerns come back and are relevant for all systems. Functionality, for obvious reasons, is one. And, and it means that for some concerns, you could describe a reusable entity, a viewpoint, uh, that describes not just the concern it frames or the stakeholders it communicates to, it also describes the models used in the viewpoint. And for each model, different languages, notations used, the techniques you use to, to create, to develop the models, or uh, um, references to, to other documents, etc. And, and the viewpoint, you can actually put them in a library. And when you uh, work in a project and you bump into a, a performance concern, uh, you need to communicate that to, to operators, uh, system operators, well, operation staffs. Well, then you bring that viewpoint out, you use the, the uh, modeling techniques to 
create the models described in the viewpoint, then you have a document which is tailored for that particular stakeholder group and that concern. So a viewpoint is like a class and the view is the object. So you can use a viewpoint to instantiate several views of that kind. So in the viewpoint, and this is important, there are a number of different models. Well, your decisions, your architecture decisions, they uh, can consider the system structure. Can also be a dynamic model that considers the system's behavior. The third type of model we see in, in uh, uh, viewpoints are argumentation models or models that support claims made by the decisions in a view. For instance, it can be argumentation that is part of the rationale for a decision. So now you have a set of viewpoints. Uh, you can uh, well fill the, the viewpoints with the models, etc. But another important aspect is, of course, which views should you use? And, and what's important here is that you should use the ones you need. And the ones you need are the ones that your stakeholders need. So what you need is decided but, but, uh, by the, the stakeholders and their needs. So create stakeholder view tables. A stakeholder view table is a simple way to organize um, the views, the candidate views. Um, enumerate system views in your columns and the rows is, is uh, the stakeholders in the doc, uh, with respect to the documentation. And then you just put a tick mark uh, in the uh, uh, column if a stakeholder is interested in that view. By that you get a pretty good overview of the views that are important for many stakeholder groups. Uh, and some that are less important. It means that you can focus on the ones that are more important, of course, and maybe you can even disregard some of the less important ones. Uh, it also makes it possible for you to combine views. If you see that there are views that are neighboring or similar, well, maybe you can collapse them into one. And by that, you can reduce the number of views. And it means that you can... Uh, well, at the end of this process, have a rather small set of views that uh, address all the stakeholders' interests, all their concerns. And uh, the models in these views and the views that you create using these models, uh, well, you can in a system have many different views, of course, uh, and it means that you need some kind of organization. And the documentation package, which they call it in the book, um, typically they separate or identify two parts of it. You have views, and in the book they have something that they call beyond views, the modeling or documentation technique they, or documentation framework they have a cut is called views and beyond and and it's structured like this that you have views and each and every view is presented in a following way you have a primary presentation you go through the elements in that presentation uh, you have a context diagram and you talk about possible variations in the view, and then you present the rationale. Uh, you should check into this template uh, more in more detail because it's, it's not 
perfect, but it's uh, definitely something that you can use as a structure when you develop your own viewpoints and, of course, when you create your views. So, look more into the different sections here, understand the sections, and see if you can map this to the 42010 standard too. The beyond views is more like a, a uh, directory for finding into finding the right paths into the uh, into the documentation. Uh, there is a a number of uh, well connections that you have to make between views uh, so a directory think of a, a a a phone directory where you can look up phone numbers here it's a documentation directory where you can look up documentation of your architect architecture so you provide a system overview you provide mappings between views if you have dependencies between views if you have the rationale for for these mappings and well there is this uh, directory of course and then the rationale so the views and beyond documentation approach and the ISO 42010 documentation standard there are quite a few similarities. They, they are based on views uh, that contains various uh, structures and models. Uh, there are also uh, three classes of views in, in, in the uh, um, views and beyond uh, the structures. Uh, but it can be different models. In the ISO 42010, there are as many viewpoints you may like. You can, you can actually expand that indefinitely, and you can connect models to these viewpoints as you like. So, so this is like the basic, how to build up your architecture documentation. Remember that you should not document more than needed, uh, if you don't need lots of binders to, to convince a big government agency that your architecture meets all their requirements, well, don't develop that amount of documentation. If it's just an architecture that is important for your internal communication in the development team, and the drawing on the whiteboard and a couple of sticky notes is sufficient, well, that's your architecture documentation. But remember to be to come up with the right documentation system, you have to be systematic. And if you have a demanding customer, be prepared that it could be quite some work to develop this documentation. 